Okay, so today's video is actually a really good conversation. Listen to this on one and a half speed, two times speed, whatever you do when you're working out, you know, doing your commute, whatever it is. But I dive into the market cycles, the yearly cycles, the 10 year cycles, how you can take advantage of this, my experiences of going through these kind of cycles uh, over and over again and building a business and a foundation that cannot be taken down by the market. I think that's what's really important here. We also talk about the advancement of technology in the industry and our agents getting left behind if they're not utilizing technology and social media. Then I break down a bunch of my investment deals, uh, my real estate, you know, rental properties, flips, so on and so forth. It's just a really good conversation with a lot of great information. So anyway, enjoy, um, smash the like button, hit subscribe if you haven't already, and let's get into it. I've been thinking about 2023 and it's like, man, this is such an amazing opportunity to triple your business in 2026 and 2027 because the ripple effects of what you do this year, if you can just keep your head above water right now and watch your database continue to grow. The biggest impact on their business is prospecting. Now that could mean a million different things. The game has really changed, man. When I started, you had to be a great deal maker. And, and then in the early to mid 2000s, you had to be a, a great deal maker and know how to use some technology. So I think the really great conversationalists around you know, sales skills, asking the right questions, and really understanding the objective, what process to really, you know, take and the direction of the conversation needs to go. I think those kind of agents can really crush it really under any circumstance. They don't have to do social media. I'm literally running this multi-million dollar business no employees but yet i'm partners with these companies that i use their employee like there's companies that have salespeople. welcome to the free real podcast so folks you know i'd like to to bring value you know i'm, I'm a pretty straightforward deal maker I, I love to to connect with real folks we've got ricky Caruth today it is an absolute treat to be able to have ricky on the show um Talk about someone that's actually doing it, has done it, and is doing it at the highest level year after year after year. He brings an incredible level of intention and focus to real estate. Uh, but he, he didn't hit it out of the park straight straight away, folks. He's a real guy with a real story. With that, Ricky, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, man, my pleasure, bro. Let's uh, let's bring some value today. Let's do it, baby. Um, the world is is going through another one of its turns, it feels like. And and I know there's a lot of folks out there on the investment side and, and, and on, the, on the agent side that are, are looking for a footing, trying to get a handle on what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's, it's super important for people to understand this is a cycle. Mm -hmm. People get lost in that, right? This is a cycle. Yeah. And you're going to have ups and downs. And, and for a guy that has had just off the charts success, uh, eight years in a row, I think you were the top agent in the state. You know, you, you're, you've you built a massive coaching business now. Of, uh, you have a significant investment portfolio. To me, your number one accomplishment, you travel with your wife and and your, your kid everywhere you go. Like, what a blessing. Like, you're, you're nailing it. But it wasn't always like that, right? And I figured if you could talk to the audience a little bit about your beginning and your kind of hiccup along the way, because a lot of us have experienced that, and and it's real. Well, I mean, <clears throat> you know, it goes like this. It's um, there's normally a like a really big cycle every ten years or so. Um, you know, the last one was kind of a long one. Um, it really lasted. Like real estate started coming down in about '05 and didn't really bottom out till about 2011 or 12 or so and start kind of rebounding as far as price goes. Um, transactions still were pretty high, 2006 and seven, and then they really crashed in 2008. Um, so what year do you actually say this was the crash? I guess 2008, that was the worst year of transactions. So if you go by that, it's been a good 15 years this time. Um, and really, if you count, let's see, this will be, this will probably be go, go down as the crash year for this, you know, uh, 10 year cycle, which is actually 15 years from 2008. So you don't really know exactly when these really big, um, crashes are going to happen, but they're going to happen. 
and a lot of people are um, worried about like prices, you know, like where prices are going to go and everything. And they feel like for there to be a crash, there has to be a price crash. But, you know, it's just not true. There's tons of recessions and recessionary periods where home prices, you know, did well, actually went up during a lot of them, flattened out dur during a lot of them, and maybe tweaked down a tad and a couple. Uh, you know, 2008 was the only one that really had like a price crash. But we're really in the crash. I mean, we're going to have about as many transactions as 2008 this year. I mean, that's a crash. Um, the reason why prices haven't really followed it, you know, when you look back and people try to compare this to 2008, um, you know, by the time transactions did hit that 4 million, you know, that, you know, low 4 million range, um, prices had already come down. Um, prices had already come down uh, quite a bit, you know, before we had that. And we're still hitting all-time highs. Um, anyway, it's it's just completely different. But m what I'm getting at is that, you know, if you get into the business as an investor or an agent or whatever, and you know, and, and, you know, and you're in the middle of, you know, uh, you, you didn't you don't go through you don't you didn't start during the ten year cycle. You kind of started you know, after the last one, and you haven't really encountered one of these big shifts in the market. Then it kind of catches you off guard. I think everybody has to go through one of those big shifts to realize that they have, kind of have to structure their business where it doesn't matter if a shift happens or not. Um, you know, you're kind of mentally prepared for it. You kind of know how it's going to go. And uh, even though there's a lot of uncertainty with exactly how it's going to go, you have a good idea. You know, like this crash, for example, you know, we, we knew that there was going to be a period where transactions fell, you know, but we really didn't know if prices would follow. You know, it could have been another 2008 or it might have been a late 70s, you know, where prices didn't have a significant crash. You know, back then we had inflation that was comparable to what we saw this year. And then we saw interest rates go to the moon, just like we saw back then. So this very similar to the late 70s. Uh, this this crash seems to me very similar to the to the seven to the late 70s, early 80s crash, you know, with the way inflation went and mortgage rates went up and the fact that prices are holding firm is the same problem back then. People wouldn't sell their homes because, you know, interest rates doubled and people were sitting on really low rates compared to what they were. I mean, they went up to 19% and people were sitting on seven and 8% and they're like, well, I'm not going to sell and then buy something that's a 16, 17% mortgage rate. So it's real similar. There was really low inventory. It was just, it's really, really similar. But back to my point, if you've never been involved in one of these shifts, then you kind of like, you're kind of discombobulated during the shift and you kind of don't want to know which way is up. Maybe it takes you out of the business completely, which is what happened to me during the 2008 shift. But then after you go through that and you kind of learn your lessons and take your lumps from, you know, experiencing it, then you kind of formulate a new business model, you know, that puts you in a position where it doesn't matter if it crashes or not, you know, and some people kind of especially in today's world with all the podcasts and you know just like this one for example you know maybe somebody listens to this and says oh okay that's you know not a big deal we just have to kind of structure our business then they start thinking about and visualizing you can do it a lot better nowadays because how much information is shared but back then there wasn't any podcasts and you know you just kind of had to go through a lot of experience you know there's books you can read and different things like that but you know listening to podcasts and things like that. It's a totally different world now. You know, people are far more, far more educated, I would say, um, in like real life, common sensible type, uh, situations. But yeah, man, I got out in 2002 and made a bunch of money, uh, mostly as an agent and I flipped a bunch of houses and got caught when the market crashed, didn't realize it was going to happen. And I thought I was on top of the world and you kind of have that, you know, miss sense of, uh, reality and then boom, you know, rug got, you know, snatched out from under me and uh, lost it all, you know, really quickly. And uh, that was fine. I went back to roofing houses. I was still in my mid-20s. I was thinking, thank God, because, you know, I was going to learn all these lessons in my mid-20s instead of 40s, 50s, and 60s, like some of my buddies who were right next to me doing the same thing. And, uh, you know, just kind of like took a couple years, roofed houses, worked on the oil rig, served some tables, 
got laid off from the oil rig and kind of forced back into real estate. And by then I'd kind of figured out where I went wrong and um, started to uh, kind of build my business the right way. And then once you kind of get that down where it's more of a snowball, I was kind of a stick and move, you know, agent. I uh, wasn't really building any relationships. and But once you realize it's more of a snowball, uh, you know, you, you build your business model more on, you know, uh, accumulation of people who know who you are and never forget who you are. And once you do that, nothing can really take you out. It can, your business can fluctuate through these large cycles, but really then you kind of start to realize you need the cycles. You need the market to retract um, to really see that massive growth on the backside of a retraction because it always explodes. And then you kind of set yourself up for the ebbs and flows of the yearly cycles that happen. Mm -hmm. and also the 10-year cycles, and that's kind of how you stair step your income, and then these really big market shifts kind of set you up if you realize all this, and too many people are um, short-term minded, and they're just, you know, like a lot of agents right now, they're thinking about their 2023, and it's like, man, this is such an amazing opportunity to triple your business in 2026 and 2027, because the ripple effects of what you do this year, if you can just keep your head above water, right now and watch your database continue to grow uh i mean it's just a no-brainer that your business is gonna you know triple 5x 10x whatever over the next three to five years and without the market retraction you wouldn't really see that i mean your your business will you know it it can fluctuate down with the market retracting a little bit you know it can come down 20 percent let's say but your business can literally triple, quadruple, five x in, in a in a resurgence in a market resurgence, you know. Um, so you just have to understand this and and use it to your ability. And most people like myself have to kind of learn that from experience and go through it before you really understand how to take advantage of the the cycles. But if you've never been in a cycle and you feel miscombobulated right now, great, you know, learn your lessons of this one and get ready for the next one, um, you know. Uh, keep your head above water, you know? There's there's a lot of uh, things happening in the market now, and I, I tend to agree with you. This is a lot more uh, akin to the 70s crash than the 2008 crash. You know, I've been doing this for, yeah, I don't know, 25, 30 years at this point. And since 2000, it was 2000, summer of 2006, I'll never forget it, when my me and my business partner, uh, at, we looked at each other as we, you know, we would get together and kind of round out what happened during the week in one of our meetings. And we both looked at each other and said, it's over. Like, th this is it. It's changed. We see it. We feel it. We know it. One of the great advantages of being a deal maker and an agent is if you're involved and you've got boots on the ground, you really do have your finger on the pulse. And it does allow you to position yourself um, to be ahead of these things. You're the first person since it's happened, that said 2005, 2006, by the way, everybody always goes to 2008, but that's not when the music stopped. Music stopped a full two, at least we felt it a full two years earlier. All you have and to do is look at data. You know, I mean, the last property I sold was January or February of 2005, you know, and it, it just, it was just crashed. I mean, I, it, it was, it really kind of happened towards the end of 2004 and things started changing. And then by early 2005, my business kind of dwindled. I had a couple of little things that kind of just closed out. And my last one was like February or so of 05. I didn't sell a single thing between 05, January, February 05 to May of 2008. And um, yeah, 2005, you know, really at the end of 2004, I think, September-ish of 2004 was really when things really, in my local market, of course, back then I wasn't studying or analyzing national data or really even cared. Um, I can only really speak on my local market, which my local market was uh, mostly secondary homes, vacation properties, beachfront, you know, investment type stuff, which is a really interesting market. But it's... Uh, you know, we were feeling in the single family home market here as well, South Alabama. But yeah, I mean, all you have to do is look at data. You can see prices kind of topped out and uh, started coming down. And um, 
you know, but you're right. A lot of people say, oh, it's just, you know, the 2008 crash. And that's when the stock market crashed. And that's when we had the least amount of transactions uh, in real estate. So, yeah, there's some legitimacy to, to saying that, um, you know, and but prices started coming down in 05 and didn't stop coming down until like 2011. So the, I think the principles stay the same. And uh, I, I think what you're talking about is when you're you're in these difficult markets, a few things are going to happen. There's going to be attrition with the competition. Folks are just not going to do this anymore, right? We'll probably see in our local market 20% plus of the agents won't come through the other side of it. So that's one segment of the market that just no longer is there uh, from a pure numbers perspective in competition. And when you're slow... There's an opportunity to build on the, the prospecting. I think probably the single thing that agents could be doing and don't do correctly that would have the biggest impact on their business is prospecting. Now, that could mean a million different things, yeah. but uh, the game has really changed, man. When I started, you had to be a great deal maker. And, and then in the early to mid-2000s, you had to be a, a great deal make, maker and know how to use some technology. Now you've got to be a great deal maker and a straight digital marketer or have professionals that you rely on that are digital marketers. Are you seeing that kind of, and it kind of the, the deal makers and the digital marketers, typically the ones at least that are most seasoned, it doesn't align. They're the most resistant to change. They're really not adopting technology at the rate that the industry is saying they should. Uh, I think this next generation of agents, if they can be intentional and focused they literally have the world in the palm of their hands. They could be super agents. Mm. Uh, but we're seeing that the, the the agents currently are having a tough time with it. Has that been your experience? Having a tough time with uh, adapting to social media and stuff, you mean? Yeah, all of the tools, geofencing, social media, SEM. There's so many different things that you have to do. And you mean like the, the older agents? The yeah, the, agents. the more seasoned ones, yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of those seasoned agents, they're going to have their systems in place, going to have their database, going to have their clientele, their loyal people. Um, they're going to be fine. Um, you know, even moving forward, you you can skin a cat. That's, that's the thing about this business is there's so many different ways to do it and every single way wins. It's just kind of comes down to what, what wins for you. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for uh, people who go into a listing appointment with uh, data on their profiles, you know, hey, I get this many impressions uh, a day or a week or a month, you know, and I'm going to be, you know, pushing your property on my platforms. You know, this is something no other agent has. This is my profile. I think that goes a long way. I've got a couple different agents that, um, that do that and they crush it, you know. So I think that if you, two things, like if you become really great at just vocal, just voice to voice communication, um, you know, asking the right questions, understand what the real in intentions are, the objective is around conversation, because you're going to have to talk to them either way. You can get, you can get the lead online, but then you still got to talk to them. And so I think the really great conversationalists around you know, sell skills, asking the right questions or really understanding the objective and what process to really, you know, take and the direction of the conversation needs to go. I think those kind of agents can really crush it really under any circum. They don't have to do social media per se. However, if they take that skill and add social media on top of it, now they're the most dangerous agent out there. Right? Yeah. So that's kind of what I'm, you know, I've been preaching, you know, make calls all morning, regardless of who you're calling, cold call, warm call, social media leads, you know, whatever. Um, but if you're not talking to anybody, no deals are going to happen. You can't just post videos and then deals magically happen. You you know, when you get the lead, you got to talk to them and figure out what it is they want to do and go through the process. But if you can, if you can, you know, focus the mornings on making your calls and then focus the afternoon on creating content, then you're going to be dangerous. Um, so it just depends on what's working for you. 
Uh, I think some of the social media guys will lose deals to the guys that are really great at communicating uh, that the social media people aren't. I think vice versa. But I think as time goes on, it's just going to lean more and more into, okay, who's got the most views? You know, who who's going to be able to get my property in front of the most people? And that's the differentiator because everybody can put the property on MLS, right? Um, so, yeah, the world's changing world's changing you know awfully fast and uh the cool thing is you don't have to be in front of the video there's a lot of these videos where it's just the house um you know it's just clips of the house with really great music that's getting millions of views yeah uh you know there's a lot of stuff like that you know there's a ton of different ways to utilize social media too you know written you know just podcasting you know writing blogs uh, you know, pictures, like there's a lot of different things you can do. Yeah. So your, your passion now having gone through a few cycles and I, I tend to, and I think what you were saying is, is you have to kind of go through it to understand it. And, and you do, uh, this is now my third, third cycle going on like fourth cycle. Um, there's no swapping out that experience Although today, as you said, you're able to access information like instantly. You can see what's happening with other people. You can rely on tips, tricks, information you're getting from other folks in real time. In the past, we didn't have that. The, mm -hmm. the business has changed so much. From when I started, we had the books and the prospecting cards. There was there was not even any mm -hmm. modems. There was nothing. Um, to where we are today, it is it's it's mind blowing. Yeah. Are you? Is your passion now with the speaking engagements, the consulting, um, investing? Where's your heart now? Uh, it's still with agents, um, you know, just trying to help them succeed, reduce that failure rate. Um, I'm just focused on, you know, making great content and trying to get better there. Uh, you know, writing, speaking, all plays into that. You know, traveling and speaking makes great content. It also... I get to see people in person and let them feel the energy and all that stuff. Uh, you know, writing, you know, books and blogs and uh, emails and just content creation, right? It's an entire media company. You know, like I'm a, I'm a one man, I'm a one man media company, you know, pushing out on every platform every day and uh, things of that nature. So through that, I have a lot of affiliated deals, you know, with companies, you know, that I make a lot of money. Um, and so it's great because I, my passion is to help agents succeed and to reduce that failure rate. And it's cool. Like it's, it's the most beautiful thing in the world when you find something that you're passionate about that you make a ton of money doing. Um, but I kind of realized it pretty early on that, you know, the personal brand was kind of the vehicle, you know, and, and sure. so just putting everything I can to try to build the brand, um, you know, and just look at opportunities that pop up. Um, I'm I'm buying I'm buying as many rental properties as I can. I'm buying something every month. Um, I just did this morning a blue tape walkthrough on two of five new construction homes I'm buying. I've already closed on three. These two are closing in the next couple of weeks. Um, I just bought a commercial building. Uh, I've got a really older two bedroom house that I'm going to buy. Uh, it's actually a fix and flip and I'm just going to buy my partners out on it and keep it because it kind of fits my wheelhouse and my criteria. But I'm like, you know, I'm sitting back and looking at this rental property opportunity and, you know, I'm really kind of in position I can buy one a month or so on average. If I do that for five years, I'll have about a hundred properties. You know, if they're worth 500 a piece, that's 50 mil. If I take 20 years to pay them all off, it's and they double, they more than double on that 20 years. It's 100 to 200 million worth of properties, free and clear. You know, Lord knows how much rental money per month I'll have coming in. So I feel I feel like that's a surefire way to to you know grow my net worth to 100, 200 mil. You know, uh, kind of on the side, not counting any business ventures or you know equity or anything like that over here, just kind of like a surefire way on the side to kind of try to build that. 
So I'm really focused on that, finding really great properties just in my local market. You know, it doesn't have to be all over the place. You know, I mean, this is my wheelhouse. I grew up here. I know every little inch of this county, you know, so it's easier for me to, to, to really look and evaluate properties here. We're really close to the beach. Like I live about five miles from the beach. So uh, like the five new constructions are literally like one mile that way. So um, they're building a new school. So yeah, I mean, focusing on the brand, you know, building business on top of the brand, taking the income from the businesses and buying rental properties. You know, that's kind of the the layout of my current, you know, game plan so i i i tend to agree and we're we're buying everything we can get our hands on out west we've we've shifted almost all of the the holdings we have out west um there's there's certain things that we we like to keep an eye on and you know when state street and and vanguard and blackrock are buying up massive percentages of the single family market and uh, I think there's more money, more money was raised in this last quarter for the build to rent model. Yeah. That the big funds are raising these build to rent models. You just bought free new construction, right? Yeah. Than, than any other market sector. And there's a presidential cycle next year. And yeah. there is uh, 40 year mortgages now. That little nugget dropped in a couple of months ago. Um, I, I believe that. When when rates drop and it's not an if it's yeah not an when. if at all okay I mean I mean inflation went from nine to three yeah okay and it dropped like a rock so I mean it's not a matter of if we've topped out as far as mortgages go I mean unless we see another wave of inflation which a lot of people think that's going to happen but unless we see another wave of inflation I don't see that because if that starts to get away like the Fed's not scared to raise interest rates. So, you know, I just feel like they'll raise it until um, till we get a handle on it. But, uh, but yeah, it, it's, there's no doubt. Uh, for the moment, from, from the data, we are, there's no way it can go higher, um, in, my, in my opinion. Uh, yeah. You know, so I see it dropping from here. Uh, yeah, I, we, we had pinned it uh, when we did our forecasting two, three years ago, we have pinned it for next year um, is when we will we'll see rates start to drop now. Um, you never know though, right? I mean, a no, lot of people said that, that, a lot of people never, said that, and I was one of them, I, I looked at the data and I tended to agree that we would be around five right now. And this was, you know, six, eight, 10 months ago. A lot of people said, you know, we'll be down because- what they were doing was they were looking at inflation and they knew inflation would come down with as aggressive as they've been on raising rates. And uh, they just, people assumed that mortgage rates would follow, um, but they didn't, right? And there's this spread that uh, between the 10-year treasury and mortgage rates is just abnormally high. Uh, but they have to base that on the future outlook of what the feds are going to do. And um, right now you don't know what they're going to do. Like you literally don't know if they're going to hang firm or raise just like in the balance. Um, so that's why rates, I think, are staying higher because until the Fed actually stays even for a couple months, I, I don't think we'll see rates really move much. And if we see a cut, then uh, then I think we'll see a dramatic drop with the uh, mortgage rates because then they're like, OK, it's heading in a different direct. It's heading in the other direction. So not only can we you know, come down, but we can also kind of loosen up on this spread between the senior treasury and the, yeah, the 30 year fixed. Um, but yeah, no, the, it, I'm with you. But either way, right. We're, we're talking micro for a minute now, but either way, rates are coming down and the cycle is going to turn over and mm -hmm. the big swing. Well, I mean, even if it takes like two or three years, right. Who cares? You know, like right. somebody locked in a 7.2 or something, on their house and they're like, Ricky, you know, do you really think rates are going to come down next year? And I was like, I don't know, but even if it takes two or three years and you refinance it at five in two or three years, who cares? Because the way I'm looking at rental properties right now is if I find something that cash flows now with rates being so high, then that's a huge winner because, 
over time, rents will go up. Yeah, maybe they only go up two or three percent instead of you know ten, but rents are going to increase. Maybe they'll level out for a second. They went up so fast. Maybe they level out. Maybe they go down just a tad, right? But they're going to level out somewhere where they are, and then they'll continue to go up just a little bit, two three percent. That's what I think. And if rent increases and rates decrease, right, over the next three years, say rents go up, say five, six, seven percent over the three years, and then rates come down, even a point is a lot of money. I refinance for a point less, which I wouldn't do. I'd wait till it got a little lower to make the refi worth it. But even a point less, you know, so if it's cash flowing now, Later, you're just going to have a lower payment and higher rent, and that cash flow is just going to get better and better. So, not of course, not every ca- every property is cash flowing right now. You really got to work hard to find the cash flow in properties, but they are out there. And uh, you know, if you put the work in to find them, then they're just true winners. You know, so that's that's kind of my outlook. Is that even if it takes two or three years, okay? You know, I'm cash flowing until then, and then the cash flow is just going to get better. Yeah. So uh, I preach, I just tweeted about it earlier. You buy value, you don't buy payment. And the good Lord is this an unbelievable time to stack value. When when you say you're buying a a, a deal a month, plus or minus, can can you share with the audience uh, a little bit about what is Ricky looking for as far as either a cash on cash or let's keep it simple, you know, uh, based on your payment, uh, or what metric is it that that says, yeah, that's that's a deal for me. Let's pull the trigger. Oh no, ten percent cash on cash is great for me right now. Um, I'm probably getting eight to ten percent on these new construction homes, just cash on cash. Um, I think I think one of them is five because we put a little bit less down, and it wasn't the best house on the road. But the other ones are eight to ten cash on cash. And, um, that's just going to get better. Now, what's cool about the new constructions are, and the reason I'm actually, I went that route because I'd rather buy something, fix it up and then keep it and refi it and then keep it. Um, but which is what I'm doing on that two bedroom, but, uh, these new constructions I'm financing through the builder. So I'm getting 5.9 interest on an investment loan. They pay 5,000 closing costs. There's no maintenance for five years. They're really nice homes. They're right across the street from a brand new school that they're building. Um, they're just winners. And the cash flow on those are seven, 800 a month cash flow on top of my payment. Um, it's ridiculous, you know? So, on two of them, I actually sold. I bought a condo for sixty-eight back in two thousand eleven. It was worth two hundred. I sold it ten thirty-one that into two of these homes and put a hundred down on both of them. The homes were like three to three fifty, depending on what where they were and stuff like that. So cheap, right? So like when I looked at the median home price in my county, it was actually higher than I'm buying these homes for. So I'm just like, man, and they're four bedroom, right? And that's what everybody's kind of leaning towards. Really great layouts. Um, there was a duplex that I put under contract for 348. It was a one bedroom on one side, three bedroom on the other. I was going to make about three grand a month on that total. The payment all in was going to be like 23, 2400. Um, I was excited about that duplex it was in a great spot in my wheelhouse i've got other properties close by and uh the foundation was was messed up it was a 60s that had been remodeled and the foundation was kind of it wasn't on a slab it was on piers and it was rotten and stuff so i had to walk but man i love those numbers big time because i knew that rent would increase payments would come down over the next three years i was like man that was a winner right there. But I think a lot of people look at rental properties and they think it's going to make me 200 a month, you know, whoop de doo But the thing is, is number one, it's paying itself off, right? It's going to appreciate. Um, and rents increase The like one of my best ones, I bought it. It was a hundred thousand duplex. Um, 
in 2012 or so for a hundred grand and it was printing for like 500 or something a month on each side and the payment was like 530 or something like that and so one side basically paid the mortgage and i'm like this is great and like yeah i tried to sell it to a guy and he was like oh i don't want that or whatever and i was like well i'll buy it right and so i bought it and uh since then like now I get twelve hundred a side, so it's bringing twenty four hundred a month in. I it paid it down. I owe like thirty on it, and it's worth like three fifty now, you know. And I'm like, dude, it's twenty four hundred a month coming in, worth three fifty. You know that little investment back then was killer. Oh yeah. Um, another was a fourplex. My lender tried to talk me out of it. You know, it was two hundred grand. It was a real dump. Two hundred grand was bringing in like five hundred per unit. And he was like, what are you doing, man? Why are you buying this? You know? And I'm like, I don't know. He's like, what are you going to try to make 50 grand over the next 30 years? And I'm thinking, bro, you don't even know. And now that was just three years ago, maybe three. No, it was like four years ago. I think I bought that. It, it's worth like 500 now. Number one, right? Bought it for 200, put about 120 in. It's worth like 500, but I've got those units up to 1250 a piece. It's five grand a month coming in. Five G's a month. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, man, that was a killer. And so like a lot of these that aren't real sexy investments, it's like, give us some time, like buy it and give it a little time, take care of the property, you know, raise the rents like you're supposed to. A lot of people don't raise the rents. And then the market for rents is, su there's such a gap between what they're charging and what it's actually worth in the market. And then it's like, well, you can't just raise it up that much. You know, you've got to kind of do it in increments and you can't get behind on that, you know? Um, and it's also a false sense of security for the tenant because say you're renting it for $750 and now it's $1,300 and you've been letting them stay there at $750 for like eight years and you just never raised it. Well, now if you kick them out or if they leave, they're, they're going to have a shell shock that they can't find anything under 1300. They've been paying 750. It's kind of a false sense of security. You know, you're, you're hitting on, on a real critical point, Ricky. I want to drill down on a little bit more in this, this world we're in. Uh, it seems like everyone is focused on adding doors, adding doors, adding doors. And some of the sharpest yeah. investors I've come across talk about what you just talked about. You, mm. you grow your portfolio from within first, always. You take care of your housekeeping first. The best way to add to your bottom line and to drive revenue is not to add a door. It's to run your properties the right way. And we do mm. fall into these patterns, especially uh, for, for us at least, it was when we were first starting, you have a personal connection, you're kind of doing everything on your own, you know the tenant. You know, you feel bad about raising rents and, and it, it next thing you know, you're seven years down the road. Like you said, the city passes some wacky new law that, you know, uh, the rent that it is is now protected under good cause eviction or whatever nonsense yeah. they pass. Yeah. And now you're locked in and all that goodwill goes out the window. And then when yeah. the it does leave, like you said, they're slapped in the face with this. Oh, my gosh. You know, I didn't realize rents were now up at eleven or twelve or thirteen hundred. Yeah, uh, so important, folks. To to the the first place you should look to add to your cash flow and add to your value is within your mm -hmm. management practices. How tight are you really running that ship? And yeah, you know, not not that that you're getting to a point of aggression in your portfolio where you're you're creating vacancies and and losses on that side, but there's mm -hmm. a balance. And if you find that balance, you could really smash it. You you talked, Ricky, about this uh, 8 to 10% cash on cash and, and the new construction seller financing 5.9%, no brainer. The the ones that are not new construction, are, are they also seller finance or are you going and getting traditional financing or what are, what are those deals? I just look at each deal, you know, I may do, I still got a couple of conventionals I can take out. You can have 10 total, I think. Um, I still have a couple of those I can use. Um, I can actually pay off those. I got a couple properties that owe like 30 on. I could just pay off and just open up another mortgage if I wanted a conventional 30 year fixed. I don't like the five year, you know, balloons. 
personally, uh, I just don't like that. But, you know, if, if I have to, I will. I just kind of look at all options um, when I find the property, you know, do I want to do a, you know, a, a no doc loan? Do I want to do a commercial type loan? Do I want to do a, you know, seller finance? It just depends. You know, yep. I don't really have a go-to. It just kind of depends on the deal and, you know, what the payment's going to be, what the cash flow is going to be, what I feel like the, uh, what I feel like the value could be. It's, um, a lot of people see, look real linear when they look at these values, you know, I, I look at them like, I look at them, you know, just based on experience. I just, I, I look at them more on like, the dollar's not going to be as worth much later, you know, um, you know, like these new construction homes, you know, buying one with a partner. And I'm like, I think this is worth like 600,000, you know, in the next say 10 years. And he's like, what? are you talking about? And I was like, well, the thing is, is inflation, bro. Yeah. I mean, 600 is not going to be like, 600 is going to be like what 450 is today in 10 years. You know, I said, do you think it'll appreciate the 450? Sure. Cause he's thinking linear. He's thinking today. Yep. And I'm like, you know, and if you keep your money in the bank, you know, if we kept that hundred thousand in the bank, it's worth like seventy in ten years. Versus we put it in the house, and now it turned into two hundred or three hundred. You know, because you own assets instead of cash. So I think cash is good to have on hand so that you can buy assets. You know, and and have that cushion whenever it makes you feel comfortable. But you know, owning the assets that's going to appreciate with inflation as opposed to depreciate. You know, it's kind of how all these people got rich. No doubt. And I think that that's the one factor that brings us in line with the 70s market as opposed to the 2008 market. While we went through this cycle just by extension because we had such inflation, prices held. And and I believe that, you know, tertiary markets became secondary, secondary became primary. There's a decentralization of the big cities everywhere. There's... Uh, literal treasure troves in in uh, some of these tertiary and secondary markets and and when this next shoe drops and and the market takes its next step uh, I believe that you're not going to see those massive deltas and price drops and that new paradigm that's been created within a certain reasonable percentage is the new paradigm and then we go into these 40 year mortgages and a a you know low inventory climate Plus dropping rates and so I, I yeah. love the strategy. And that's just another um, fear, you know, is that there's so much demand underlying and there's so little inventory. There's really nowhere, there's no path to more inventory, right? It's just going to kind of be a gradual thing that happens over the, over, you know, a lot of time. And so prices really have nowhere to go but up. Unless we get into like some really big rate increases, right? Unless it goes to, you know, eight, nine and 10% mortgage rates. Um, you know, that, that's kind of like, it's all going to depend on rates, but nobody really sees that happening right now. Nothing in the data shows that mortgage rates are going to go that high. Could they? Sure. Who knows? But the fear is, is that as rates ease down, this just <laughs> this beast of inventory hits the market. I mean, I mean, of demand hits the market. Yeah, and prices shoot up. Well, that's like the definition of inflation. You know, um, I mean, if, if you've got just people buying houses left and right, more than asking price, and then more than asking price means everybody has more equity. Now they're taking out equity lines of credit, um, especially the people who are buying at these higher interest rates, they're going to refinance at lower rates and take some equity out if prices are shooting up. Um, they're going to have more money to spend, so they're going to be buying more stuff, more goods and services. You know, all this is the, is the definition of inflation, right? Which, you know, we're, we're kind of teetering in this conversation, you know, that we're basically saying in so many words, inflation is going to come back. And right. going to come back but but at that point in the cycle, it's called the bull market, right? They don't call it inflation. It's 
Well, it, dep it depends results. on. Yeah, but it the thing is, is you know, if it comes back and you know it's hanging around three or four, whatever, right? Whatever. But if we see another 2021 type year, which is what I think is going to happen. We've got more demand, in my opinion, more demand right now for people that want to buy homes than we had in 2021. Way more demand. Yeah. We've got all these people that want to move but can't because they feel locked into their homes. They want to. You got all these first time home buyers that we didn't have in 2021. And they've just been they're just they're just accumulating. They're just piling up, piling up, piling up. And when the lever, you know, flips and rates come down a little and all this demand just hits the market i just it's going to look similar in my opinion to 2021 what's going to happen is is the trade-up seller they're going to put their home on the market but they're also going to buy one and take one off so it's going to be a net even for active listings then the first time home buyer is going to come in with no home to put on the market they're just going to go and take one off the market which is going to be a net negative for active listings so we're going to see this jump in new listings we're going to see this decrease in active listings but we're going to see a real spike in overall transactions. So we're going to see active listings drop, new listings spike, and transactions spike. Yeah, It's going to be a hell of a year. But the problem is, is, is that also, the question is, okay, is, does that mean inflation? Does that mean inflation, right? And do we go back to an, a, a scary, a scary inflation number of, I mean, let's face it, if, we go went from nine to two, back to six. That's scary. Yeah, the feds are going to come out and do some stuff. So, you know, we're, we're getting into the weeds here of what might happen, this, that, and the other. And when I say scary, I don't mean scary in a bad way. I just say that we could go through this all over again, which wouldn't be a bad thing. It doesn't matter what happens, right? And I mean, and that's in the that message. In that That's scenario, it. prices went up. If you're buying properties now, you're a winner. Yep. Right? Um, and that means rent's going to be higher too. Yep. You know? That's why I'm trying to tell people, buy properties now. You know, don't wait for rates to come down because that's when prices are going to shoot up. That's right. You know? That's right. So uh, I think to your point, um, we, we could see inflation or talk of inflation sooner in the cycle than we would like to, but I think we would have to account for this last rip here. So much of the inflation was caused in part to these uh, logistics issues and legitimate shortage of goods. And, you yeah. know, hopefully they stay away from the COVID talk and hopefully, you know, we, we can keep this on the level here and we stay away from the shutdowns, it's the damage done there is it's tough to quantify, but that's a that's a big part of I think why we we jumped into such an inflationary cycle this time. If we're giving folks the ability to stretch out the value and take these forty year mortgages, which you know that's a whole I could talk for two hours on that. Well, uh, the forty year mortgage thing is just going to be another lever that could be pulled to make prices go higher. Uh, I mean, if you're just making the payment lower, you know, then people yep. can pay more. And uh, I think the, I think what they're trying to do is make things affordable for people who can't afford it. And I can appreciate that. But what you're also doing is you're making the people who can already afford it be able to afford more. Yep. Right? Yeah. And, and when you see the big, the big funds I touched on earlier, State Street, Vanguard, uh, BlackRock, uh, there's a number of them scooping up these one family homes like this, it, it, yeah, you know, those guys that. own about three hundred thousand homes, right? Yeah, collectively. I, I think it's more at this point, but yeah, yeah. I mean, say they own a half a million homes. You know, I think there's fifteen million rental properties in the U.S. There's over a hundred million households. So right now, they don't own a significant amount at all. Um, you know, we see the writing on the wall. Do you think that the, do you, what do you think the possibility is that the government steps in and says, hey, here's a new tax code. Here's a new, here's a new rule, you know, for businesses that own X amount of homes or whatnot that makes it uh, dis disadvantageous for them to go and do this.
I think you'll see that, but the die is cast. The, when, when we started to see the amount of money going into uh, single-family home construction, being multifamily is the thing of the past already in that world, to me, that locked in. This is the run, and after these big funds cash out at the, the rip that we're talking about, then you'll see that type of legislation, and then it'll be on to the next product. But yeah. I think that, man, if you can stack assets now, it, it boy, oh boy, you're in for a, a really great run. There's just too much smart money, and there's too many factors that are lined up that tell us, uh, the folks that have been through this two, three, four times, that uh, the other side of this thing is going to be a, a historic run. And we're doing everything we can to get this kind of information out uh, to folks that you know, makes a big difference. You know, yeah. well, hopefully we're inspiring people to get off their couches and yeah, and go pull those triggers, man. For sure. Why do you think uh, they switched from multifamily to single family? Um, I think the the multifamily market got way way oversaturated. You know, when mm. when the syndications went from um, some sound metrics to uh, you know, in a market where the syndicator had no experience, we were seeing this every day. We were seeing that they were going to come in and, and cut management expenses by 30% in an inflationary period. They were going to raise rents by 20%. There was a loss to lease because if you added a, a washer dryer, you know, some sort of amenity, there was another 10% there. It, it got so wonky and, and so crazy that they ran to the short-term bridge debt and- you're 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 starting to see the beginning of that collapse, but the the bottom is going to fall out on that market. These banks that provided the bridge lending, the investors didn't give themselves time to get to the other side of the rainbow because the delta between a three and a five, or a five and a seven, and a seven yeah. and a ten, it broke the deal. And if if you're making, they really dodged a bullet there. Some yeah, smart with that. You know, I get it. You know, that's why I say I don't like the five year balloons. Yep. You know. Um. So you got to get to the other side of the rainbow with your debt. That's the trick. Mm -hmm. You know, so much of what you preach about in in your books, in your uh, videos, on your platforms is about not thinking about today or tomorrow or next year. Mm -hmm. Right. It's about two years, three years down the road. That's yeah. how you make it in this business in every aspect. And I mm -hmm. think that when, you know, the that market in particular, they just got a little goo goo gaga and when you're looking at those things and and a quarter of a percent is what breaks the deal you, you shouldn't be doing those deals at least in our minds you shouldn't have been doing those deals yeah so can you spend a couple of minutes talking about to zero to diamond and your crm i know you guys are working on a crm did that drop yeah so um we're it's in beta right now um we've picked up a bunch of clients and we're just working now to work out all the bugs and make everybody super happy. Um, it's so cool because today you can build businesses and you don't actually have to like build all the back end, you know? Um, it's it's uh, like, I don't know, not even like five, 10 years ago, you had to actually hire like developers and stuff like that. And you don't have to do that anymore to create a product and stuff. Um, so that's what's really cool. But no, Zero to Diamond is still going strong. It's uh, it was the first completely free real estate coaching program. And um, we're still still going hard. The best place to find everything about it, next trainings, like I'm doing a three-hour prospecting workshop this Thursday. Of course, this podcast will be out before, the, you know, after that. But um, the best place to keep up with all the trainings and scripts and what I'm doing and, you know, events, like I'm going to be in Sarasota next week and then Miami, late October, Vegas, early October. I'm doing three a month, just traveling around, speaking and stuff. A little less this time of year, but just Instagram, my Instagram account, the link in my bio, that's really kind of takes you everywhere and anywhere you need to go, you know, to get the training, um, you know, connect with me, whatever. So, so the, again, it's, it's in preparation of this. One of the things I had tweeted the other day was that there are so many experts out there that are charging for the education piece. And if they were really as good as they say they are at that piece, they wouldn't have to charge for it, right? Because we understand the value on the real estate side 
and coaching is a separate thing altogether, and providing a service is a separate thing altogether because we do the same thing, but you're imparting knowledge for free. And it's the only platform I've seen where the actual know-how, it's all there. And if people yeah, yeah. just take the time to do the work, like you lay it all out, man. It's pretty remarkable. I think there's something to be said. You know, I see both sides of it. Um, you know, the guy, I know a lot of these guys that charge and have these coaching programs and are really super successful. I mean, I know I know a guy that makes a million a month. I know a guy that makes five million a month selling courses and stuff. And um, they're actually great guys. And, you know, their their thing is they believe so much. And, and like, I get it that they believe that if somebody's not paying for something, they're just not really going to take it serious. Yep. Um, you know, and I've seen the power of that. I've seen the power of that through some of these uh, some of these coaches when they do events. You know, the type of people that show up to these events um, are serious. And uh, so there's a lot of validity to that, you know. And it just so happens that their philosophy makes them a lot of money. Coaching's different, though. Right. Coaching, I think, is a different level. I, I have a number of coaches. I believe in it wholeheartedly. But the, the core basic information, I think, is it's something. Like I say, there's a lot of different philosophies on it. And I've looked at all of them and I totally like I get all of them. But I I have a different business model. You know, my yeah. business model is everybody know who I am. Right. And then build businesses on the back of that. You know, um, try to create the most influence. And like some of these guys that charge for coaching, they have massive influences too, you know. Um, but I wasn't born with the ability to do that for whatever reason. Um, so you kind of have to figure out where you fit in the world. You know, like I thought for a long time, let me do a course. Let me build a company. Let me do a different bunch of different things. And it drove me crazy because I'm like, I'm leaving all this money on the table. But then I just realized one day, wait a minute, my place in the world is not to like build the company and run the employees and do all that, but more so to be partners with companies that do that, you know, and use their. And so it's interesting because, you know, I my place in the world of influence is being a great partner, being a great affiliate. And it's cool because I get a cut right off the top of revenue and I have zero expenses, zero liability. Well, not zero liability, but very little. I'm not the company. Um, I'm not running the employees. I don't have payroll. I don't have insurance. I don't have any of that stuff. I'm just a guy right here at my house. That's it. I don't have a company full of people. It's just me. Um, I've got a full-time assistant that mostly runs the real estate sales business, which my dad runs the day to day of. Um, she's been with us for a decade, but she more like just runs the, the like local real estate sales business part of it. Um, and so it's really cool. Cause like, I'm literally running this multi-million dollar, um, business with no employees, but yet I'm partners with these companies that I use their employee. Like there's companies that have salespeople right? And like, they're my salespeople, you know, their customer service, their marketing departments and stuff like that. They, they treat me just as if I'm their boss, you know, a lot of these companies, but I'm not paying their wages. I'm not training them. I'm not having meetings with them. You know what I mean? I'm just utilizing what the company built. And some people might say, well, you don't get any equity that way. Well, the thing is, some of these companies give me equity, right? For this, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. Plus I take the money that I make and buy assets, building equity. You know what I mean? And I, I knock off at five o'clock. I'm off on the weekends. I travel and do what I want to do. All this money coming in is passive. You know, it's just a snowball I continue to build because it's fun. But yeah, I do it a little non-traditional. Because some people say, make your first hire, then build on your team and have your organization and build out a company. And I'm like, nah, I'd rather just chill, make 25% off the top of any top line revenue without any of that stuff. You know what I mean? But the power, the reason that I have that option is because 
I decided to do free coaching and build a brand, you know, and it took me, you know, a good couple of years to build it up to a point. And now I've been doing it for six years. There's a lot of blood, sweat and tears. I mean, I lost a hundred thousand for two years in a row, you know, that I invested into building the brand. Then I finally made some money, you know, then I made a half a million, then I made a million, you know, and I just kind of keep building it out. So yeah, I understand both sides of it though. Like I used to really hate on the paid coaches. Like I used to just go hard. Um, and I still kind of go hard on a lot of them. Uh, you know, I look at a lot of them. I'm like, that is one of the guys that, you know, I was talking about in the beginning when I used to hate on paid coaches, you know, I'm like, there's one of them right there. But yeah. then I've come to find, I've come to know some of these other guys and not even in the real estate space, other spaces as well. Yep. And I'm like, you know what? They really have something, you know, but it doesn't change my opinion on like wanting to continue to be a free coach because I mean, did you see what Al Tremosi just did? Did you no. see the book launch? Oh my God. That was just that, that validated everything that I'm doing. You know, Gary V kind of was the original OG of validating the free coaching thing for me. Yeah. But now Alex Ramosi has come in and like tripled down on it, you know, and I'm like, okay, I'm not, I'm not crazy. <laughs> you know, I'm not nuts here for what I'm doing. Well, you're certainly not nuts. And and I think, you know, you're, you're right. To be fair, there's, it's not a one size fits all. I guess what, the, the stuff that bothers me is when you see more and more and more and more people talking about, you don't know, don't the, oh, you don't know multifamilies, buy my course. Now I'm going to show you how in five steps you're going to, and it's like five steps to owning multifamilies. Like, yeah, there's, there's 5,000 things you need to be aware of. Yeah. Especially if you're going to syndicate and take people's money. I've been looking at multifamily for probably two years now, really hard studying that market and studying the business and syndication and all. And I was pretty set on doing syndications there for a little while. Um, but then like through, through the, through the smoke, I was like, I can just go buy little properties around here and build a couple hundred million dollars worth of worth just buying little houses around where I live. Yeah, I'm like, why do I want to go take other people's money? Not to say that I won't ever do it, because mm -hmm. I probably will do a few deals where I go out and raise some money. There's no doubt. I, I just, I just made an offer this morning on three acres, uh, right down the road from me. Really great corner piece, great corner piece. But you can build apartments there, and you could probably get thirty or forty, and um, you know, it's it would be a great piece. And so if I do that deal, I'll have to go out and raise some money, you know, to 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 do it. And it'll be a great deal for everyone, you know. If but, but that's it. But but that, there's nothing wrong with raising money. Nothing it, wrong with it at all. Right? It's it's when you're you you don't have the experience and you're yeah. trying to to pitch this as something that it's not. Right. This is right. not a five step deal and now you can go run a three hundred unit building seven yeah. states away. Yeah, that's the stuff that gets under my skin. I mean, this one that I'm going to build is literally like two miles away from my house. Yeah, like you know? and and, and uh, like you've been doing this for for a very long time. You know the game. You obviously have a profound understanding of the markets, internal and external factors. It's that stuff that bothers me. I, I know a lot of people over the years that have gotten hurt putting money in, into these deals, and I think for the most part, people are well intended. And people get caught up in the hype and in the cycle. Uh, yeah. But real estate's a tricky game, man. Like, this isn't a joke. This is It really uh, can be. Yeah. yeah. If, you, if you're not buying with a long-term game plan, you know, it's like these duplexes. I, I bought them with intention to keep them forever. Or like that condo I sold and flip it into two DR Horton homes. My intention was to keep it forever. But then, now here we are, you know, 11 years later or whatever, and I sold it and flipped it into two houses. The 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 point I'm making is is my game plan was very long term. It, the plan may change, but as long as you your 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 game plan protects you over the long term, 
then you can do whatever you want to do in the interim. Like if something comes up or, you know, it shoots up in price and you want to sell it and buy some other things or whatever. Um, but for me, I'm like, let me buy stuff with the long term in mind, you know, and then we'll see what happens. It's like these new construction homes. I'm like, well, I'll just keep them forever. But in five or seven years, they may be worth 500 and I want to flip them into two other properties somewhere. You know, that's I love 1031s. I mean, you, you know, you know, buy and hold for five, five to seven years. You know, that little two bedroom I'm buying, you know, for like 190 probably going to be worth like 350 you know, in eight years. I'm not buying that to keep it forever. I'm buying that. I will keep it forever because rent's going to be crazy good on it. But if it goes up to 350 I can sell it and flip all that money into two other properties. You know, now I'm making appreciation on two properties instead of one. No doubt the 1031 exchange, the QOZBs, there's a lot of great ways to to defer the, the tax and and be super smart in your approach and scale. You know, Ricky, this has been an absolute pleasure. I, I, I really do appreciate the candor the, and uh, it, I, it's, it's, I've been doing this for a while and it's seldom you come across someone that has your level of experience and this is just honest and open and willing to kind of free flow chat. You dropped some amazing bits of information that I'm excited to share with the audience. Um, folks, if you want to learn more, as Ricky had said, his Instagram is a great place to look, but all of the links will be below. Ricky Groove, this has been an absolute pleasure, man. Thank you so much for the time today. Appreciate it, bro. As ever, always, me. Yeah, man, this was great. Everyone out there, please, as always, stay safe. Hey, man, this was a great chat.